Hello? Hello. Okay, there we go. Okay, welcome back um, for our 2.30 press conference. We've entitled this one, Winter is Coming, But What Happens When It Leaves Early? Um, I'll just introduce an introducer. Um, we will have uh, Anjali Bamse. Uh, she's program director of the Climate and Large Scale Dynamics Program in the Geosciences Directorate of the National Science Foundation, and she'll introduce today's speakers. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, this is a timely topic given that we are just a couple of weeks away from the advent of yet another winter. So uh, understanding cold season climate has tremendous societal impacts. And uh, researchers sponsored by various directorates and offices across the National Science Foundation are engaged in cutting edge interdisciplinary research that is examining the impacts of cold season hydrology and ecology. Today we have two scientists who will share their insights with us. First, D Dr. David Inouye from the Department of Biology at the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, for each summer since the past several decades, David has been researching at a site at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory at an impressive height of 9,500 feet above sea level. And he's been studying the impact of, in particular, today he'll share insights on the impact of early snow melt, on the phenology, plant flowering, abundance, and the ecolog other ecological impacts. Next, we will have Heidi Stelzer. She is assistant professor at the Fort Lewis College at Durango, Colorado. She has been studying alpine ecosystems. Both David and Heidi have uh, funding from the Division of Environmental Biology at NSF, and Heidi also has funding from the Office of Polar Programs. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm happy to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing uh, with the assistance of funding from the National Science Foundation recently. And I guess I should start. Start with this slide, uh, pointing out that uh, the work I'll be talking about has been done in collaboration with my postdoc, uh, Dr. Amy McKinney. And in the background there, you can see a little bit of the, uh, the mountain scenery that uh, is the uh, Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. And although that's what it should normally look like this time of year, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a preview here and say that uh, this is now the driest winter uh, here uh, in this part of Colorado uh, in a, since at least 1973. Uh, 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 people are still driving in and out the road to the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab where typically they would have to be skiing in and out this year. And so uh, all the Colorado ski areas are, are uh, people are skiing on man-made snow right now because uh, we haven't had uh, si significant uh, natural snowfall yet this winter. And uh, the timing of winter's end is changing in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And uh, the reason I focus on the end of winter is because the date at which the snowpack disappears uh, sets the clock for most of the phenology, uh, both animal and plant phenology, or the, the timing of seasonal events. And that includes the arrival of uh, migratory birds. It includes the uh, emergence from hibernation of small mammals like marmots, chipmunks, and ground squirrels. Uh, it also marks the beginning of the growing season for plants that I work with. And so the date at which the snow melts, uh, we've uh, recorded with a help of a collaborator since 1975, and uh, there's a huge range, a huge variation, uh, all the way from the 23rd of April, which was this past year, uh, to the 19th of June. And even just over a two-year period, to give you some idea how variable that can be, uh, in 2011, uh, the snow melt date was the 7th of June, whereas this past spring it was the 23rd of April. And our study site is up at uh, 9,500 feet uh, or 2,900 meters, and the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory snow melt now averages about two weeks earlier than it did in 1975. 
Uh, so it used to be that I could finish up teaching the spring semester at the University of Maryland, head out to my field site, and get there about the time that the snow was melting and uh, flowers were starting to come into bloom. Uh, that's no longer the case, so my postdoc collaborator had to fly out in the middle of April this year in order to be there at the time at which flowering uh, first began. Oops. So why the earlier snow melt? I'll show some pictures in my talk tomorrow of uh, some of the reasons why we think this is happening, but uh, it involves in part a lower amount of snowfall during the winter. It involves in part warmer springs. So for instance, the uh, April minimum temperatures have increased 3.1 degrees C since 1973. Uh, and uh, this past April, when we had such an early snow melt, it, the uh, April mean temperature was actually 3.4 degrees C above the 38-year mean. And another uh, factor which uh, makes for some pretty dramatic uh, uh, changes and something that you'll hear more about, I think, from Heidi's work, involves dust storms, which seem to be increasing in frequency. And when you get a dust storm that deposits uh, a dirty layer on top of the snow, it greatly changes the albedo of the snowpack and causes the snow to melt maybe a week or even 10 days earlier than it would have without uh, that dust on top of the snow. And those dust on snow events seem to be uh, happening more commonly now. And uh, if you look at the ratio of how much of our annual precipitation is now falling as rain instead of snow, at lower altitudes, it's already uh, been pretty dramatically changing for the last few decades. So in Gunnison, Colorado at 7,700 feet, or in Aspen, Colorado at 8,000 something feet, uh, uh, there are pretty dramatic changes over the last few decades. In Crested Butte, which is a little bit higher, it looks like we may have just reached a tipping point in the last few years uh, where we're starting to change to a ratio of more of our winter, more of our annual precipitation starting to arrive as rain instead of snow. In terms of consequences of that earlier snow melt, uh, the earlier start to the growing season raises the probability that we're going to see frost damage. So uh, what's happening is that, uh, let, let me say historically what happened was that the date of snow melt was pretty close to the date of the last hard frost, which is typically about, oh, the 10th of June, plus or minus a few days. And so historically, the plants were not very far developed when the frost hit. But now, when we have snow melt occurring as much as six weeks before the last frost, as happened this year, uh, then uh, uh, there's a very high probability that the plants are going to develop buds, that those buds are going to be sensitive to frost, and that the frost is gonna, going to kill the flower buds. And so this year, uh, when we had that snow melt date on the 23rd of April, we had hard frosts in April, we had hard frosts in May, and we had another hard frost in the beginning of June. And as a consequence, uh, the wildflower capital of Colorado, which is Crested Butte, Colorado, had very few wildflowers for the uh, tourism uh, and for the wildflower festival this year. And unfortunately, that seems to be becoming a more common event. So that increased frost damage means fewer flowers for the tourists. Uh, it means uh, less nectar and pollen being produced for pollinators, including uh, uh, a large number of native species of bees, including bumblebees, including hummingbirds. And also then, uh, because the flowers aren't there to make seeds, there are fewer seeds for the seed-eating insects, for seed-eating birds, and also for, for mammals. Uh, there's uh, also an effect on plant demography, or the population biology of the plants, because if you're not making seeds, it's difficult to replace yourself uh, through sexual reproduction. And we have some evidence that, in, in fact, some of these wildflower populations are declining because, uh, uh, probably because they're not making as many seeds as they used to. Some of the additional changes that we're seeing in response to these earlier winters uh, include that uh, these interactions among species, like pollination and seed predation, are being affected. Uh, this past year was just a terrible year for pollinators, and it's going to take at least a few years for them to recover uh, if we have a, a good year for flowering. And uh, as I mentioned, it's looking like this winter may be another uh, unusually dry year, uh, which is uh, a bad forecast for the pollinators. Uh, for example, although both migratory hummingbirds and their floral resources are changing their phenologies, they're not changing at the same rate. And so we published a paper uh, this fall in the journal Ecology pointing out that uh, these mismatches in the arrival dates of migratory hummingbirds and the blooming of the flowers that they typically visit when they get up to, to 9,500 feet uh, are leading to a situation where hummingbirds uh, start to arrive after the 
the uh, food plants have begun to flower, and that sets up the probability or the possibility that uh, when, the, when the hummingbirds need a lot of nectar to feed their young, that, uh, that those flowers aren't going to be there, either because of the phenological mismatch or because of the effects of frost uh, reducing flower abundance. And I'll, I'll talk some more about that example in my, my talk tomorrow in the session that uh, Heidi helped organize. Uh, there's been a similar loss of synchrony affecting uh, bumblebees. So we have some evidence now from a colleague at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab that the earliest blooming wildflowers, the uh, glacier lilies, that historically blossomed right about the time the queen bumblebees were coming out from there, uh, spending the winter underground, uh, those flowers are now coming to bloom before the bees come out from un underground, and uh, therefore those earliest blooming flowers are no longer being pollinated. So another example of a, a loss of synchrony. And uh, there are also researchers at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab who've shown that marmots are now putting on a lot more fat before they enter hibernation thanks to the growing season, the longer growing season. So uh, for, for marmots, it may not be such a bad uh, situation to have that longer growing season. Whereas for, for pollinators, uh, because of the effects of frost, uh, the, those earlier snowmelt dates uh, and the earlier end to winter are uh, a particular problem. And then, the, as I mentioned earlier, the forecast for this winter, uh, we've already have the lowest early winter snowfall since at least 1973 in Colorado. And it looks like it may be a second winter in a row with low snowfall. And that will be the first time that that's happened since at least uh, 1973. Although we've had dry winters before, including the, the winter of 76, 77, which was the one that convinced all the Colorado ski areas they had to put in snowmaking. Uh, uh, though we haven't had two dry winters like that in a row previously, but that, that may happen this year. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there and just say that uh, I have a lot of color photographs. I have a lot of data graphs from the studies that we started in 1973 and have continued until uh, now are still ongoing, uh, courtesy of uh, financial help from the National Science Foundation. And if you, uh, if you need any uh, data graphs or, or photographs of the wildflowers or of snowpack or frost damage, things like that, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for coming. I'm also going to tell you about what an unusual climate year it was this year in the Colorado uh, Alpine, in this case. I'm going to share with you results from the summer from a two-year project that I've been doing with Julie Korb, a colleague of mine at Fort Lewis College. And there are a whole host of undergraduate students who've really enabled us to be able to do this work, because uh, the type of life history change work that David and I have been undertaking is pretty time consuming. We need to have people going to high places on a regular basis, um, which involves a lot of hiking. And luckily, at Fort Lewis College, there isn't a shortage of um, students ready to hike up mountains for um, to collect this type of data. So the setting for the research that I'm going to tell you about is an alpine meadow on a hill slope in southwest Colorado in the San Juan Mountains. This uh, meadow, which is pictured here, is at about 12,000 feet elevation. So it's a little bit higher elevation than uh, where David's been telling you the results of. 2012, as David mentioned, is a year that snow melted extremely early. What I'm showing you here is a picture of what our, snow, our site looks like in 2011, which is a much more typical year. In mid-June, the site was just becoming snow-free in 2011 with areas just um, emerging from snow cover and plants just beginning to grow. In contrast, this is what that same site looks like this year with six weeks earlier snowmelt. Snowmelt began in mid-April this year at our site, and we had plots melting out through April and into mid-May, but by mid-May there was no more snow at our site. And, uh, and in addition, and one snow event occurred during that time period, um, but we didn't see any rain on snow. So David highlighted that one of the things we're looking out for is whether or not there are rain on snow events. We didn't see any rain on snow. We didn't see any rain um, at all. Uh, virtually no rain fell at our site from, for the months of May and June. 
so climate this year was characterized by more than early snow melt in the Colorado Alpine. It was also really low May-June uh, precipitation that had an effect on the plant life histories this year. The monsoon rains, which typically began in, uh, begin in July, began when they typically do, um, but it was too late in the year for many of the alpine plants, which had um, started growth much earlier in the year than they normally would. 2012 is a climate year that's atypical for the past, but it's expected to be more typical of climate years in the future. And so this kind of a climate year offers us an opportunity to gain some insight onto what might be the life histories of alpine plants and subalpine plants in, uh, into the future. And the prospects based on what we saw this year don't look good. The first thing that I want to highlight is the timing was off. The timing was off because snowmelt wasn't the cue that many plants used, uh, to time, in the alpine that is, um, for the timing of when growth began. Typically it is the cue that signals plants to begin their growth. And when it's the cue that signals plants to begin their growth, we typically see mean plant growth occur about 10 days after snowmelt and mean flowering time occur about 20 days after snowmelt. This year, we found uh, mean flowering or mean growth times to be 20 to 45 days after snowmelt, and mean flowering times were between 35 and 60 days after snowmelt instead of that 20 days following snowmelt. This is a missed opportunity for the plant. It's a missed opportunity for the plants to be able to use resources from the melting snowpack. That includes the water from the snowpack and, that, uh, and also the nitrogen. The nitrogen in the snow and the nitrogen that um, becomes available as the snow melts and saturates the soils and the microbes become um, active. Those missed resources are like missing lunch. And then with no rains coming, it's like missing dinner, or it, like dinner was never even served. So the plants missed lunch and then they didn't get any dinner this year. Alpine, um, one of the things that we're learning about alpine species um, based on the results of a year like this is that they seem to be fairly conservative. They have multiple cues that, that signal the plants for when to begin growth and when snow melt is no longer the cue, other cues become uh, more dominant. So temperature cues and photo period cues, the, the length of the day, um, might be other cues the plants use. So despite this delay in when um, the plants began growing, the growth still happened at a time that was atypical for the alpine tundra. So the graph that I have here shows in white circles the timing of snowmelt. In green and yellow, you're looking at the timing of spring events, greening and flowering, so first leaves and first flowers. And in the, gray, in the black and the brown dots, you're looking at those early season senescence, the early season shift to dormancy um, that occurred this year. The bars at the bottom of this graph show you a range of dates when these um, events typically occur. So normally we see snow melt and first leaf development in uh, the month of June. We normally see flowering during July, and we normally don't see senescence until August and into September. This year, what you should be able to see is that greening uh, occurred and was complete um, by, mid, by the end of May. Flowering occurred in June instead of in July, and many of the plants senesced before the rains even came. What um, the plots, the areas that we study at this field site in our alpine meadow, um, ranged in when they um, became snow free. And those dates, the different dates that our plots, our study sites became snow free, are listed on the y axis. So we have dates from April 12th up through May 10th. So all early, but still a range of over a month when plots became snow free. And what I hope you can get a sense of is that there's no correlation, there's no relationship between when those plots became snow free and when greening and flowering occurred. So that tells us that that wasn't the cue that signaled the the timing of those events. In contrast, there was a significant relationship between when the plots became snow free and when those late season, what should be late season events, uh, occurred. So we saw a relationship between when plots became snow free and when the plants senesced. In the, early, the plots that melted out earlier, we saw the plants senesce earlier. So early snow melt led to earlier senescence and, and an earlier shift to dormancy for the plants. To me, this suggests that alpine plants may have adapted to run instead of walk. 
They're used to snow melt happening and then uh, uh, moderate conditions following snow melt, a time when there's a lot of resources available. And they race through those early life history events, greening and flowering, and transition rapidly to dormancy because in the, in the historical alpine tundra, it could snow any day of the year, including midsummer um, in July and in August. And yet we're not seeing that as much as we used to. So how many species senesced? Of the 32 species in the alpine meadow, we found that um, nearly 50, greater than 50% of the species senesced early this summer. They senesced in June and July and instead of in August and September. An even greater percentage of the species, um, just about 75%, we saw uh, at least one non-green leaf, so an indication that the plants were starting to shift to a dormancy phase, even if they didn't fully shift to dormancy. I want to highlight that some plants stayed green. So you can see those gray parts to the pie charts. There were some species that stayed green all summer through these um, stressful conditions. Um, so that's also an impressive aspect of the biology of alpine plants is that they are stress tolerant um, and they can handle difficult conditions, just not all of the species. Two of the species I want to highlight are sky pilot and alpine rock jasmine. These are alpine specialist species. These are species that you wouldn't find anywhere else other than in the alpine tundra. Both of these are species that senesced early. So they had senesced by, um, by early July. Sky Pilot had a different strategy than alpine rock jasmine. Sky Pilot didn't regreen and didn't reflower um, once the rains began, but the alpine rock jasmine did. So we saw a second phase of greening and flowering for one of these two alpine species and not for the other one. And we're not really sure which is more beneficial. Um, in some cases, it's good to, in a bad year, choose to not grow at all and wait it out and hope that the next year is going to be better. Um, rather than putting additional resources into a second period of flowering that's at the wrong time of year and may not be that successful. Uh, so there's still more to learn about the biology of these, of these alpine species since we can see these different strategies. The final results that I want to tell you about is that we had a warming experiment um, as part of our study in this meadow. So we use little mini greenhouses, a common approach in a remote landscape for warming the tundra to increase air temperatures and understand that if early snowmelt occurred in coincidence um, in a warmer climate, um, would the results be different? Would we see uh, a better outcome for the alpine plants in the system? The results that I'm presenting here are presented as the difference from control. And so those negative values that you see are the number of days earlier that the different life history events happened um, under the warm conditions. So warming um, caused events to occur earlier, but was only significant in advancing the timing of those um, senescence events, of the shift to dormancy, rather than in the start of greening and growth. As a consequence, um, it's a shorter life history. So um, the outcome wasn't improved by the warming climate that we um, experimentally imposed in the system. We saw early snowmelt led to an earlier shift to dormancy, and warming led to an even earlier shift in dormancy. These aren't what we might have expected, um, because the alpine tundra is a landscape where um, We've always, we've always talked about it as a landscape where late-lying snow, snow that remains into June and July in the landscape, limits the plants from having a longer growing season. And yet what we're seeing is that we, when that constraint is relieved and the plants have a longer growing season, they're not actually able to take advantage of that longer growing season, at least in a climate year like this when um, there's also really low precipitation. So the implications. Our results uh, provide us with an understanding for alpine plant life cycles during a climate year that could occur more often in the future due to climate change. The flowering happened early. The alpine vistas just worked as spectacular, which I hope you can get some sense of from these pictures that I'm showing you. Uh, I mean, that's the site in 2011 when I jumped for joy across the meadow, uh, amazed at how beautiful it was and that I got to work there. And in 2012, this year, I just kept wondering. I just kept thinking, really? This? This is what the meadow looks like? Um, of course it's still a beautiful landscape. Of course the scenery is still spectacular. Um, but the meadow is just not what it would have otherwise been. And if you're a visitor um, coming to the Rocky Mountains for your first and possibly only trip ever to see the Alpine Tundra, um, 
the, what you saw this year and um, your expectations, um, you might not have known that it wasn't a good year and that the plants could really be that much more spectacular. I want to highlight that um, as a context in which to set the results of the research that David and I are presenting. That um, for many Americans, uh, we have a bucket list and there are amazing things we put on our bucket lists, including getting a chance to go and see some of the Earth's most amazing landscapes and ecosystems, places like the coral reefs and uh, the tropical rainforests and the alpine tundra and the spectacular plants uh, that live there. The strange thing that's happening is as, as the environment changes, these, um, these things that we hope to see are getting crossed off our bucket list for us rather than us getting a chance to do them. They're changing before we ever even get a chance to see them in some cases, which I think is fairly significant. There are dandelions at our field site, but people aren't coming to the alpine tundra to get to see a plant that they have in their backyard. They're coming to the alpine tundra to see the really, really unique species that are there um, with tiny little leaves and giant flowers. Uh, and those uh, tiny little leaves were dried out and shriveled up. And the giant flowers, um, there just weren't as many of them as there would be in a typical year. As David mentioned, I organized a session on this topic of winter changing. So if this, um, these two talks that, that we've presented on the Colorado Alpine are of interest to you, there's a whole session um, with much of the research in the session funded by the National Science Foundation, including a very similar study to what I just presented the results for that we've been doing in the Arctic tundra. So you can learn about the Arctic tundra, changes in the temperate um, forests, changes in winter, in desert systems, in grassland systems, uh, across the US, and some people have come to present the research from the Alps and other sites around the world. Uh, winter's not changing in the same way in all these places, and we're looking at the consequences for year-round changes, not just changes during the winter season, but how a change in the winter season has an effect on uh, plants and water and chemistry year-round as a result of those changes in winter. This research couldn't have been done without the collaboration of my colleague, Julie Korb, um, who's also here, and uh, the students that work with us, the undergraduate students that were willing to hike up and down these mountain hill slopes two to three times a week so that we could have um, a really good understanding of what was happening this year in the Alpine Tundra. We have uh, funding support from our college and from the Colorado Mountain Club and from the Mountain Studies Institute, um, which are nonprofit organizations in Colorado um, aimed in understanding more about Alpine Tundra and research and systems in, in the Colorado Alpine. And climate data for us that helps us put our study into context was collected by the Center for Snow and Avalanche Studies, which has an amazing meteorological station um, just up the road from where our study site is and, and provides a little bit longer term context than our two year study. So thank you very much for coming and I think it's time for questions now. Okay, uh, who has questions for our panelists? Yeah, I'll point out also that uh, Cheryl Dibas from the National Science Foundation's press office has brought some copies of a press release that has uh, additional information and some photographs on it, and she's back left there, and if you didn't get a copy of that. Uh... Okay, any questions? Rick? I may have misunderstood something, um, but it seemed like I heard the two of you say almost opposite things at the start of each of your talks about whether or not, um, uh, if I'm understanding right, um, in, at the lower elevation site, um, the, the plants came out much earlier, but you didn't experience that at 12,000 feet in the same year. Can, can you explain what's going on? Different species or what? Different species, yeah. So um, we looked for and anticipated, based on David's research, that we might see early greening, early flowering, and frost damage. And we were ready to observe those events, but they never happened. We just didn't see the plants um, develop much leaf structure or flowers until things started to warm up. I think that those last few words she said about when things warm up are really key there. Uh, there seems like uh, some of the plants at high altitude have to accumulate a certain number of degree days or experience a certain amount of warmth before development really takes off. And if the plants melt out very early as they did this year, the air temperatures may still be relatively cold and so they aren't accumulating very many degree days and it takes them longer uh, to, to get going. And so we, we do have some uh, data from my long-term studies that, that, uh, that make that point, and we have a manuscript in preparation now showing that uh, there's sort of a lag time if uh, following early snow melt in some cases because the air temperatures are still so cold uh, at that time of year.
Uh, yeah, so I, I guess the big question is wh why do you think this is happening? Uh, what's going on? Well, I, I think uh, in terms of earlier in winter, there is a consequence of a combination of factors. So one of which seems to be that there's a trend towards lower snowfall. And that trend uh, g therefore generates a lower snowpack. And then uh, there are at least a, two variables I can think of that influence how quickly that snow melts once it's fallen. Uh, one of which is warmer spring temperatures, and we've seen that that happens at least in April with regard to minimum temperatures. It doesn't get nearly as cold as it used to at night in April, and therefore the snowpack uh, tends to melt more quickly. Uh, and, and then uh, the second variable that I think is influencing the, the snow melt it relates to uh, these dust on snow events, and there's a, uh, a picture of some of those in this press release that uh, Cheryl's provided. And, and this year it was particularly low snowfall um, in those warm temperatures. Uh, the dust levels, there was dust on the snow, but it wasn't particularly high year for dust on snow this year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Brian Bastig from the Washington Post, by the way. Um, so the, the other question I have is, so last year it was kind of an average or late snow melt, right, on the, the running average. This year was very early. What's, is there, is there a trend, uh, you know, over the past 10 years or so? Yeah, huge variability um, among years, including just these past two years, but there is a trend towards uh, earlier snow melt. Uh, it's, it's now happening, oh, I think on average about a week earlier than it used to, I think was the number I, I had in that slide. And if, if you need uh, uh, numbers, I'd be happy to help provide those numbers. Cool. To Thank me, you. what was significant about this year is that we couldn't possibly um, create an experimental manipulation to simulate the kind of conditions we saw this year. So the only way to learn about this kind of a climate year is by having this kind of a climate year. And, and I guess I felt somewhat fortunate in that weird sense of, of having an opportunity to, um, to do research and, and characterize it, because David, in 40 years, has only seen a year like this one other time. Um, so we've got some more years to come. Rich Monasterski with Nature. What uh, do you think is the potential for these species to adapt to um, changing conditions? You know, obviously it depends on how quickly and, but also how much variability they are used to seeing. So if you could address the variability issue in the past and in the future as well. Uh, um, so my, my study dates back to the early 70s. And one question I've always had, well, how characteristic is this, the 40 years that I've, I've studied at this site? And one way we've been able to get a, a little bit of, of a hind casting perspective on this is because of the strong correlation between uh, how much snow there is and when that snow melts and what happens when it, when it melts. It runs into the river. And there's a stream gauge downstream uh, where, where we've been able to look and, and uh, find that the peak runoff, uh, the timing of the peak runoff correlates very well with when the snow melted back up at our study site in the mountains. And what the peak was is a very good correlation with uh, how much snow there was to melt. And so uh, that stream gauge goes back to the 1930s. And so I, I can basically double the, the length of my perspective by using that kind of a, a hind casting technique. Uh, to go beyond uh, uh, that period, we, we may have to, we have to look for some other alternative ways. And, and uh, there are some nice studies going on now looking at variation in precipitation in the, in the southwest using uh, reconstructions from tree rings. Uh, so we may be gaining some, some better insights into that uh, that way. Uh, in terms of the question about uh, how much plasticity is there and what, what's the potential for evolutionary changes, uh, we're, we're get, beginning to gain some insights in that too. So we, we had a paper come out this spring uh, in collaboration with uh, some researchers from Duke University who were doing the genetic aspect of how much genetic variation is there for traits like time of flowering. And we put their information together with my 40 years of data on what, what, how much variation has there been in, uh, for flowering of this particular mustard plant species and showed that uh, most of the variation that the plants have demonstrated so far is probably uh, uh, the product of the plasticity that they have uh, for timing of flowering, but that they're starting to push the limits where if they're going to be future changes, they're going to have to be evolutionary changes. And there, there are a few studies of, uh, of wild plants which indicate that uh, there is the potential to evolve those kinds of responses fairly quickly. Uh, there was a study from here in California looking at uh, responses in flowering time of a radish uh, 
uh, a wild radish plant, and they, they were able to show uh, uh, over a period of, I think, about 10 years that there were some significant changes in, in the uh, uh, genetic basis of those phenological traits. But you're right, it's going to start pushing the, the uh, ability of those plants to respond with uh, plastic built-in variation, and they'll, they'll have to start responding evolutionarily or suffer the consequences. Anne Rosenthal, SF Nature blog. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some insight in what's causing the increase in dust storms. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, the changing changes in the Colorado Plateau. That has, so the dust is coming from the Colorado Plateau. So it's U.S. dust um, that's covering our mountains. And um, there are a lot of ecological changes, um, land use changes that have happened on the Colorado Plateau in coordination with uh, a warmer, drier climate um, that people think are leading to and contributing to the increased uh, dust in the mountain. Well, contributing to dust in the mountains, we don't have long enough time series of data of monitoring dust to know whether or not there is any increase currently. We just know that dust is higher than it was pre-European um, settlement of the Colorado Plateau. Um, so uh, land use changes, increased land use, um, different kinds of land use in combination with the drying climate um, disturb the soils and um, lead to dry soils and then the, the soils can move when the winds come. I think it may be partly a consequence of, of grazing activity, partly a consequence of off-road vehicle use. Um, but those are some of the examples of human-related activities that could be breaking cryptobiotic crusts and allowing more wind erosion to occur and therefore more dust storms. There are a couple of spectacular photographs that uh, I've seen in the last year or two of dust storms hitting Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, just great big huge clouds of dust rolling in over the city and uh, I think it, uh, uh, some of that dust could be coming from, from that area as well. Uh, I'm Molly Samuel from KQED News and I'm sorry if you already answered this but I, I came in a little late. I'm wondering if aspect made any difference in the studies and if you've seen any range shifts with the plants. Um, the, our study site was on a south aspect and it was on a hill slope. So uh, a lot of alpine research is across hill slope topography and we would expect to see something different potentially at the base of a hill slope than on a hill slope, but a lot of the mountains are hill slopes. And one of the things that's amazing about the San Juans is that uh, when snow normally melts, there's not long before the monsoon rain season starts. And so there's actually an amazing diversity of plants on on steep slope terrain um, that I haven't seen in other parts of the state as much. Um, so, um, so as far as it, it being a hill slope, and it was a south aspect, so uh, north uh, north facing aspects could have been a little bit different, and certainly valley bottoms could have been a little bit different in having more water. But the the meteorological record for water content at a more flat area shows um, uh, outside of the normal trend for soil water content, even in flat areas this year. I have uh, 30 plots scattered across the, the landscape at my study site, and so it incorporates some that melt out earlier, some that melt out later, and there can be a significant variation across that landscape because it's so such a great topographic relief. Um, but uh, uh, so that it can play a factor. So I, one reason we're now trying to monitor snow melt uh, per on a per plot basis rather than using one date for snow melt for the whole study area. What was the second part of your question? Yeah, I forgot it as well. Rain shifts. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's one species, a, a bluebell, a mertensia species, which for the first 20 or 25 years of my study was increasing in average abundance, uh, peak abundance over years. And then about 1998, it just sort of fell off a cliff and has now been close to zero ever since. And I think what's happened there is that the, sh the bottom end of the range for that plant species has been moving up. In about 1998, it, it arrived at my eleva study elevation. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been monitoring what's been happening at the higher end. But it does look like there has been this gradual change, uh, let's see, from Crested Butte, which is about 8,800 feet, up to where I work at 9,500 feet. Over the last 30 years, the plant seems to have disappeared from 8,800 feet and is, is now disappearing at 9,500 feet.
And David's study is really unique for Colorado um, to have 40 years of data on a single set of study plots. It's just incredible. Um, my colleague Julie and I are, are racking our brains to figure out how we can manage the same task over the next 40 years for our careers. And, uh, and we don't have, throughout most of the Colorado Rockies, um, with the exception of David's site, that kind of a record um, that's comparable to what we see in Europe. So, so they've done a better job being able to detect rain shifts in the European alpine setting um, because they have uh, older historical records of, of what plants were there. We also have some data that bumblebees are, are changing their altitudinal distributions. So we did some surveys of altitudinal transects walking up mountains and recording different bumblebee species in the 1970s. And when we repeated that about, uh, about four or five years ago, on average, uh, eight different species of bumblebees, the queens were found about 220 meters higher than they had been uh, back in the 70s. So it looks like the bees are moving up and they can, of course, respond much more quickly than, the, than, the, than these perennial, long-lived perennial wildflowers can. I'm uh, Harvey Lyford, Freelance. I'm just trying to pin down that which is truly new in what you've presented today because we've known the general idea of this for some time, thanks to your research and others, that species are changing, different ones are moving up the mountain as it warms, and, and all these other things, the mismatches between birds and flowers and, and similar phenomena. But aside from the data of the last year that uh, a different kind of snow melt or different timing of snow melt, is there a fundamentally new discovery you've made here in the last year or two that, uh, that I've missed as you presented everything? I think a lot of the generalities, as you point out correctly, uh, have been known or at least guessed at over the last few years. And I think one of the things that uh, is important about the work that Heidi and I are doing is that we're really getting to know this at, at, at the level of details now, which particular species are frost sensitive, which particular species are, are no longer uh, matching the uh, phenology of their pollinators or their herbivores or seed predators. So some of it's uh, the, uh, the devil really is in the details of, of finding out what are the details of responses to changing phenology. Um, and then I think the, another thing is that we're beginning to see uh, uh, that the extremes uh, are, are changing. So uh, this was a record early snowmelt uh, last year. This is a record early uh, uh, late beginning to the snowpack this winter. And we're starting to see that some of the uh, increase in variability that I think has been predicted by uh, some of the climate models previously. But now, now we have the, uh, the observations showing that, yeah, these predictions of some of the models are, are coming true. I've never seen the alpine tundra as brown as I saw it this year. And um, as my, uh, I've been working the alpine for 20 years. I, I'm older than I look, I think. Um, but I, um, I began graduate school um, studying the alpine tundra in 1994 and um, have studied it off and on for this whole time period and certainly lived in Colorado the whole time. And I've never seen the alpine as brown as it was this summer. And um, I live in a community of um, mountaineers and hikers, um, and everybody else around me was saying the same thing. And again, I mean, that's a, a mountain community that, that has seen and experienced the tundra over a long time, longer time period. Um, and a visitor to the state wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't know, wouldn't have recognized just how different and more spectacular the alpine can look. The other thing that I felt like was really surprising about what we did this year is that we did a previous study to simulate the effects of dust on snow and see how plants would respond. And we didn't have any warming chambers uh, in that study. And so we thought, well, maybe with warmer temperatures, uh, the plants would be able to reach an earlier threshold for that, that accumulation of heat and, uh, and green up earlier. And yet the one to two degrees warming that we increased with the warming chambers wasn't enough to see much of a shift in the timing of spring events. Uh, and I don't feel like we understand the cues well enough. Um, what, what system of multiple cues do plants in a really risky place to live have in order to be able to make sure they don't green up until it's a good time? And that that's one place that we're seeing some differences between the alpine and the subalpine is your question at the very beginning um, highlighted that there are some differences in what we're finding for, for different elevation zones. I'm Ernie Balserac. I'm with EOS, the newspaper of AGU. Um, I have a rather basic question. Um, how wide of an area 
was affected by this early snow melt um, this year? Was it just a few mountaintops in Colorado? Was it the whole Colorado Rockies? It's very widespread. So okay. I, I think uh, as one example, I'll point to uh, the fact that this year there was uh, the first time I've ever seen it in the, uh, the NOAA weather forecast for our area was blowing dust. I've never seen an alpine uh, subalpine forecast <laughs> with blowing dust before. And I, I got, uh, uh, I sent, started searching around to see how widespread was that phenomenon. And it was uh, much of Colorado. It was into Utah. It was in Arizona. And so I think many of the uh, weather patterns that create things like early snowmelt, like having a dry winter or dust storms or warm springs, happen over a very wide region. So those, uh, uh, these kinds of events are characteristic of, of much of the, that part of the Rockies, not, not just a local area. And, um, I think the map that I saw was actually published in EOS showing that there was uh, really low snow across uh, southern, the four corner states in Southern California. And, uh, and that we saw a different pattern for snowfall in the northwest and into Alaska that got um, a lot more snow. So that uh, an uneven spatial distribution of where the snow came. And I was also wondering, um, are the plants that you're studying also fairly wide ranging or fairly unique to your study sites? I think they're characteristic of much of the Rockies. Okay. They're, they're widespread. There are not many endemics in this area. Thank you. Okay, I think we are out of time now. So uh, thank you very much, panelists, for speaking today. And thank thanks you for your everybody time, everyone. from the press for coming and for your questions. And we have our next press conference is at 4 o'clock, um, which we are calling Superstorm Sandy, Black Swan Cyclones, and the Economic Toll to Come.